Good evening. I'm Ramanan Krishnamurthy. I'm the Chief Energy Officer here at the University of Houston. And welcome to uh, the first of our four-part series uh, the, of critical issues in energy. Uh, this is our fifth year of the Energy Symposium series, and we couldn't start it off better uh, than with this panel that is uh, going to be talking to us about uh, electric power and, and the grid. Uh, before we get to the panel, I need to thank a few people. First, our sponsors, uh, Houston Public Media uh, and uh, Fuel Fix and Houston Chronicle for their media support. Uh, our Energy Advisory Board, uh, which consists of 23 of the leading energy uh, uh, sea level folks in the Houston area and beyond who have uh, been the uh, idea behind the symposium series and the activities of uh, UH in the energy area. Uh, want to thank our energy fellows, some of whom are here. Uh, this batch of uh, energy fellows uh, just uh, got started about a few weeks ago, uh, and they uh, are the intellectual powerhouse behind the university's uh, strength in energy-related issues. Uh, they, they contribute to some of our best blogs that get uh, showcased in, on Forbes.com, and, and, and on average uh, hit about 5,000 uh, hits per blog uh, that, that gets published. So amazingly uh, influential people, and we thank them for their support of UH Energy. We couldn't have this sort of an event without the support of our student volunteers that come from the Energy Coalition. We brag about them not just because of their size. It is the largest student organization that's, uh, that's energy focused anywhere in the United States. They have over 5,000 members in it. Uh, but they are also amongst the best uh, in terms of what they put together uh, in programming, not just for students, but also for, uh, in terms of uh, career uh, advancement opportunities for themselves as well as for alumni. So thank you for all your support and what you do for UH Energy. I uh, want to also thank all the staff at UH Energy who put together uh, this event. So in terms of Q&A, we do this in a, in a way that sort of takes advantage of the fact that you can take out your cell phones and play with it during, during the uh, panel uh, conversation. Uh, we ask you to submit your questions uh, online, uh, and these questions then get collated and our, our moderator gets to uh, ask them. In case you need to leave somewhere uh, through this uh, conversation, we are showing this entire program on Facebook Live. Uh, it, is, it is something that you can find on Facebook and UH Energy, uh, and it's a, it's a program that uh, I think has a pretty large audience of people who actually watch it either live or after the fact. And so this is something that we certainly provide as a resource to you. After the conversation's over, we ask you to stay and join us for a, uh, a small snack, uh, but also an opportunity to speak with our panelists here. Uh, with our panelists, one of whom who is not yet here, we're hoping that she'll make it uh, from, the, from Harvey Airport pretty soon, and one of our panelists who has to also leave a little early because he's got a, another uh, pressing engagement uh, across town. So uh, with, with that exception, uh, I, the rest of the panel will be here. They will be available for you and uh, uh, for a conversation uh, at your own leisure. So with that, and with all the, uh, with all the I's dotted and T's crossed, let me hand this over to our moderator here, Victor Flatt, um, who's come back to the University of Houston after several years of not being here. Uh, he is uh, one of our law uh, professors here. Uh, he, he's come back from North Carolina, and this is our way of welcoming him back and saying, here's your opportunity to shine in the spotlight. Uh, and so thank you so much, Victor, for doing this. Thanks, and with that, uh, thank you all in the panel for serving. Thanks. Thank you, Ramanan. Let me again welcome you to um, what I know uh, is going to be an interesting evening. Um, I want to first introduce our panelists, and then I'm going to set up a, a little bit about the bases uh, from where our issues are coming from. Um, so in order of, of speaking, um, Joel Mickey, um, and then John Berger, Ed Hears, and we're hoping Heather Payne um, will be here shortly. Um, John Berger, uh, I'm sorry, let me start with Joel. Joel is the Senior Director of Wholesale Market Design and Operations for ERCOT, which is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. 
Prior to joining ERCOT, um, where he's been for um, over 15 years, uh, he worked as a staff consultant at a software development firm specializing in energy trading and risk management systems for restructured electric and gas markets. After graduating from a power line installer program, he joined Houston Lighting and Power, which is now Centerpoint and Reliant, where he worked for 15 years in various positions, uh, including network tester, system controller. Um, in other words, he, he knows it all. And uh, he knows it all, and he uh, then took that knowledge to ERCOT. Um, John Berger is the CEO of Sonova Energy Corporation, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. He was one of the co-founders of Sonova in 2002 and serves as the chief executive officer. Prior to Sonova, he co-founded and served as CEO of Suncap Financial, which is a residential solar uh, power service company. He co-founded Standard Renewable Energy before that, which was a top 10 installer of renewable energy and energy efficient products and services for residential, commercial, and government customers. He also co-founded and served as managing partner for Contango Capital Partners, a venture capital firm focused on renewable energy and energy technology companies. He began his career as an analyst in 1996 for the Enron Corporation, including serving as director for Enron Energy Services. Uh, next, we'll hear from Ed Hears. Ed is here at the Department, uh, I mean, the University of Houston, the Department of Economics, where he teaches energy economics courses to both undergraduate and graduate students. He's also managing director for Hill House Resources, LLC, an independent uh, EMP company developing onshore conventional oil and gas discoveries on the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, previously, Ed was the chief financial officer of DJ Resources, Inc., an early leader in the Neobrara Shale. He has authored and co-authored many opinion pieces on energy markets and corporate governance. He founded and co-chairs an annual energy conference at Yale University, and he's frequently consulted by national and international media. His articles and quotes have circled the globe with the impact of bringing apolitical energy economic analysis uh, to many important questions. Heather Payne, who we hope will be joining us shortly, uh, is the assistant director uh, for the uh, Center for Climate, Energy, Environment, and Economics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, she is also an assistant uh, professor there now. Um, before joining CE3, she clerked uh, for Judge Martha Gere for the North Carolina Court of Appeals, um, and she's worked in the private sector for nine years before law school um, as a systems engineer and her research currently focuses on electricity innovation and changes across various states uh, with new uh, systems coming online. Okay. Well, I wanna start um, with a bit of a background. Let's see if we can get there. Oh, no, back up a little. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of, of background slides I want to start us off with because I think they help illustrate um, what we're talking about tonight. Um, so the way that power was produced and distributed has changed little, changed little from the end of the 19th century throughout most of the 20th century. Once the big fight between uh, Westinghouse and Edison was uh, concluded, and uh, large-scale power one. Um, we have primarily relied on centrally produced power. Um, this centrally produced power has to be matched with demand through the grid. And we have, as they've evolved, laws in states and at the federal level that favor both lower cost production and reliability. Um, because of the way the grid works and the way uh, energy is distributed, this tended to create what were known as natural monopolies, leading to direct state oversight of most of these power companies. Um, these natural monopolies would get money from, of course, producing power, creating an, inf an incentive for infrastructure build out. That's how they receive their return on investment. Um, the concept of, of meeting energy growth in, or electricity growth in any way by, say, lessening demand was not even considered until the 1970s um, during the uh, energy crisis at that time. And so uh, there was always the incentive to continue to grow, that there would continue to be demand for electricity. Um, our 
a country and economy was geared toward converting more things to utilize electricity um, and for electric growth, uh, growth in these centralized power plants and growth in demand. Um, and the fact that they wanted to have low cost power and reliability favored what we call baseload power. Um, that is power that can be produced uh, at, uh, co constantly and varied uh, according to control uh, to match uh, demand. Um, so that's how we were. Um, but we've seen a, a lot of changes. Um, and the change really started um, from a legal point of view, um, excuse me, with the entry of non-hydro renewable and small-scale generation. These were initially spurred by the energy crisis of the 1970s and the uh, subsequent passage of the Public Utility Regulatory Power Act, or PURPA. It was implemented in 1978 for three main reasons, to encourage conservation of energy, to encourage optimization and efficiency of utilities' use of facilities and resources, and to encourage equitable rates to consumers. It did this by also requiring traditional regulated utilities to accept independently produced power onto their grid. Now, this happened starting in the 70s on, on a, quite a small scale. But since 2000, we've seen a large scale increase in non-hydro renewables, primarily spurred by climate and environmental policies. Just to give you um, the picture of this, you can see that between um, 1950 and 2016, the very large growth of the non-hydro renewables, that's in green, going from almost 1% now to about 8%, that's primarily wind and solar, um, and I think it's, it's gone further now in 2017. You also see the co-committant reduction of coal and the increase in natural gas. And that gives us approximately what our mix is now of the power sources that are producing this. Um, however, the addition of the renewables did create questions of intermittency and how that affected reliability of the grid. Um, if power was being produced in a non-steady way, how could that be matched as easily to demand? Another big trend that occurred around 2000 that was, is, turned out to be incredibly important is the deregulation of many of our electricity and energy markets. Um, this began on a wide scale in 2000. We're all familiar with this, or many of us are familiar with this, uh, as it occurred in Texas, and we'll hear more about that. But in addition to Texas, um, we have seen the creation of something called regional transmission organizations around the country. Um, and for these, they, uh, the pricing of power has become more important. And that's because in these so-called deregulated markets, it favors the lowest cost power producer more explicitly and in real time. The um, regional transmission organizations dispatch the lowest power in real time. Uh, Texas uh, has bids coming in for that, and you'll hear more about that. So is the growth of renewables or low-cost dispatch a threat to the reliability of the electric grid? That's been a huge debate, and we're going to learn more about that tonight. Are there benefits from renewables, uh, not just the detriment of so-called so intermittency? Are there other costs? Um, and what do these have in grid impact? All right, I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Joel. Thank you, Joel. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here today. Um, let me go to the first slide here. So how many of you knew that we're, Texas is already a microgrid and you're already part of one? Good job. You know, it actually just occurred to me, this is the first time I've ever said that we're a microgrid. <laughs> but if you look at the, uh, the rest of the North America, there's two large power grids, interconnected AC systems, the Western Interconnect and the Eastern Interconnect. And ERCOT is all by itself. So I think we can say we're already a microgrid, just a very large one. <laughs> Going on, uh, we'd already talked about this a little bit, but um, in around 2000, uh, one of the reasons ERCOT's around, ERCOT was always around for reliability, but in 2000, the uh, electric utilities were split up into, the, the regulated electric utilities were split up into three parts, the transmission companies, um, 
uh, the wires companies and the retail electric providers. And we'll, I think we're going to go more into that in a minute, so I'm going to jump through these slides. The uh, primary purpose of ERCOT, how many of you know that, by the way? All right, balancing the, the generation and the load. So when you go around at your house and flip on a light switch, you don't call anybody and say, hey, I need you to turn up your generation because I'm turning on this light switch. Or when you're a large industrial customer, you just turn on a motor and it magically starts and there's magically enough power for that. What ERCOT does is we're like a big cruise control. You use the power, you set your, um, your cruise control for 60 miles an hour in your car. Your, your engine doesn't know that you're going up a hill or down a hill. It just is monitoring whatever speed you want to go. And so if you set it for 60 miles an hour, power in equals power out. And if you start to go up a hill and slow down, the cruise control kicks in, puts a little bit more gas to the engine, and you go 60 miles an hour again. Well, that's uh, in, a, in a super oversimplified way, that's what we're doing. We're, we've got the power grid on cruise control. As a sum of everybody in Texas, when you use more power or less power, our systems are monitoring the frequency, the AC frequency, and we're raising and lowering the generation to match the demand. Let me get caught up here. So we also have an energy market. Each five minutes we set at ERCOT the uh, locational marginal price for electricity all over the state. It's several thousand different locations, and every five minutes we set an equilibrium price for that power depending on the value of the power at that point of injection. Um, then there's four different load zones, and that's, that's the zones that you pull power out of, and their load weight average up into those four load zones. Houston is one by itself. If you look at the annual energy cons consumption in Texas, uh, the first thing you'll notice is it's going up. Uh, if you look at some of the other ISOs around the country, it's actually, it's actually flattened out. And the main reason for that is Texas has a lot of industry here that is still growing. With the fracking boom, there's a lot more load in the fracking areas. There's also a lot more load here as we compress natural gas and ship it as a liquefied LNG. There's also more feedstocks that are, that are consumed here from natural gas, and it's getting hotter. So all those reasons, the load keeps going up. If you break down the usage by customer type, I've got this broken into two different, uh, two different time periods. One is a, is a, no, a non-summer day. It's what well, we'd say a winter peak, but it's really, this one's in March, so it's, I'd just say it's a non-summer uh, hot day. If you look at that, you'll see that large commercial customers on the bottom are about, about half of the consumption in a given day, and the, the small commercial customers are about a fourth, and the residential customers are about a fourth. But if you look at a peak summer day, the industrial customers just come up a little bit. The industrial, or I'm sorry, the large and commercial customers go up a little bit. The small commercial customers almost double but the residential customers use almost four times more energy in the summer. And I think you probably know why that is. It's your air conditioners running full out. So if we look at installed capacity, um, I believe there was a slide up a minute ago about over the United States. This is just Texas. You'll see the, the top line dropping down. That is gas units. That's the old big power plant gas units that basically boiled water and made steam, what we call a conventional steam power plant. Those have been going down. They've been replaced by the, the light blue line, which is going up right below it, and those are combined cycle units or gas turbines, which are much more efficient. Uh, also, you'll notice that coal is the next line down. It's, it's gone up a little bit over the last few years. Again, this is installed capacity, not actual uh, energy uh, produced by that. And then last, you'll see the green line, which is the wind. Texas has a lot of wind here, and uh, uh, it's been a very big growth product here in Texas. Sorry, overstepped. Now, if you look at the actual power produced by the power plants, it's a little bit different story. You'll see that gas is the top line. It's, it's been fairly steady. It's changed a little bit depending on, uh, a lot of times it has to do with what the coal price is versus the gas price and then other reasons. Um, but you'll, the main thing here you'll notice is coal has come down some. 
and it's really come down at the expense of the wind increasing. And then nuclear stayed about the same, mainly because we haven't had any new nuclear plants. If anything, it's gone down a little bit, and that's just because they're a little bit smaller piece of the larger load that we've had over the years. If I look at uh, wind generation capacity, that's where we've had huge growth here. Uh, back when I started, we had almost no wind. Now we have over 20,000 megawatts, and it's increasing rapidly. And interesting to note, if you had asked me five or 10 years ago if we could handle 20,000 megawatts of wind, I, first I would have said, I don't know. And, it, and if you made me guess, I'd say, I don't think so. But luckily, it's come, it's come very fast, but it's come fast enough that we can learn from it. And now we're one of the leading uh, uh, regions that has one of the largest percentage of, percentages of wind. And we go, I've, I was just down in South America a few weeks ago talking to them about how they can handle more renewables. I was in Germany a few months before that talking about the same thing. We are one of the leaders in, in penetration of wind, and people are trying to learn from ERCOT of how to handle that much wind. If you look at solar, it's going up, but it's not very significant in our region right now, but it will be. You know it's hot here, it's sunny here, and it's, it's uh, just a matter of time. If you look at the little Texas map, you'll see that it's it's a lot, there's a lot more emissivity in West Texas, which is actually good for us because we can then put the solar out there and when the sun goes down here in Houston, it's still gonna be sunny in West Texas and we'll get a little bit more output, which reduces the problem that like California has right now. If I look at um, why we are able to handle the renewables, we can break it down into four different things. Our grid codes, and our grid codes, um, our renewable forecast, our, um, I can't read it here, ancillary services and real-time operations. So our grid codes are things like, we, our, our wind units have to be able to handle a momentary outage like a lightning strike on a transmission line. They need to stay on long enough to ride that through so they don't just trip off and we lose 20,000 megawatts of wind because there's a lightning storm in West Texas. That would be pretty hard on the grid. Uh, we also learned that we have to forecast the wind. We can't rely on individual wind resources to forecast the wind. Um, and forecasting is very important. Forecasting is not as good as forecasting like the temperature, but it's getting better each year. And then ancillary services, we have to look at the net load now instead of just the load that you have. We have to look at the net load with the wind and the consumer load and make sure we have enough uh, capacity online to handle any of those ramps uh, changing from the, of the power usage. And lastly, in real-time operations, we have to be able to have those wind units actually follow our real-time signal and curtail if we have some kind of a transmission constraint. Talking about DERs, or distributed energy resources, um, we think that's gonna be a very growing field. Uh, we don't have a lot here compared to like California. If you look at my chart here, we have less than one megawatt units. We have 30,000 of them, but they're very small. It only adds up to about 250 megawatts. And units larger than one megawatt, we have about 850 megawatts. It equates to 140 units. But that's something that we're, I'm spending a lot of time on right now is how do, we, how do we know where they're at and incent them to be a part of this market? So one of our goals for DERs is to know where they're at and model them, know when they're gonna come on, when they're gonna come off, what kind of fuel they have, what kind of characteristics they have. And also, right now, they get the, the, that load zone price. We would like to pay them the LMP price because that will incent them to be built in areas where there is shortages. Anybody heard of a duck curve? So this is the ERCOT duck curve. I wanna call it armadillo curve, but it just doesn't look like an armadillo yet. But um, if you, it's really hard, there's so many lines here, I, it's gonna be hard for me to explain this slide well, but basically one of the lines in the middle is where we're at now. As we get more renewable energy, whether it be solar or wind, it's gonna make the, the load changes during the day a lot more dramatic. And that just means we have to have more resources that can respond to that, whether it be uh, quick start units or batteries. Lastly, or almost lastly, uh, we have some DER reports for those of you that like to read. Uh, if you have trouble sleeping, these are really good um, packets to get and you can read what we're thinking about DERs in the future. And then fairly lastly is cybersecurity. 
Um, yes, we're worried about it. Uh, yes, we're doing something about it. I can't tell you what we're doing about it because I don't know. They won't tell me either. But we have a lot of people at our, our company that are professionals on that, and they're 24 hours a day, they're monitoring the threats. Um, you know, I get frustrated when I go to another country. I can still trade my stocks. I can still check my bank account. I can still chat online. But ERCOT doesn't even show up in a lot of countries out there because we block um, a lot of that, which makes it hard for researchers that are interested in ERCOT, by the way. And last, last slide is just these are some of the entities we work with to... Um, to get best practices for cybersecurity. We, we do drills, we do um, uh, threats, we, we do phishing um, uh, tests all the time. All the time on my email, I'll click on something, they go, oops, you just got, you know, you, if this would have been a real threat, you, you just got compromised. So they're doing everything they can to keep down the uh, threat of cybersecurity. And that concludes my presentation, thank you. Good evening. How are y'all doing? Um, before we get started, I just wanted to ask y'all one thing. Uh, keep the people of Puerto Rico in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of employees down there, thousands of customers, and they're going through, uh, they're going through hell uh, in the last 48 hours. And of all communities in the country, we certainly understand at least part of what they're going through. So uh, please do that for us. Um, we're going to talk first about what we are seeing, and most people in town call the future, and what we're seeing is that, no, it's the present, and things are happening very quickly. Um, and uh, that is that there are changes that are going on with the traditional infrastructure. And there's two parts to this, and that's the power or stationary infrastructure and then the transportation. So it's a fancy way of saying cars and, and, and uh, trucks and, and so forth. Uh, what I think is interesting here, and there's been some thoughts about, you know, put forth about what exactly causes disruption. I will, I'll be the first to say I think disruption is used over and over again where it shouldn't be, but in here it really is happening. And that is, is that when you look to see an industry really change, like telecommunications in the 90s in the last decade, it wasn't one technology that really shifted it. It was multiple technologies, so think about that. Think about cellular technology, think about the internet, think about the chip technology. There was a lot of things that came together that really brought about huge changes, not only in the telecommunications industry, but also in the media industry, which is a tangential or overlap industry with the telecommunications, as we all know. For energy, Stationary is, is a large industry, but transportation is also a tangential industry. And what we're seeing right now, I wouldn't have predicted a couple of years ago, uh, like Joel, Joel said earlier, but what we're seeing right now is that solar in the last eight, nine years, since I've been at, at, with the uh, three companies, has fallen roughly by 95% as far as the panels go. It's a dramatic de uh, a decline in pricing. It is something that is very similar to the semiconductor industry and what we've seen in computer, uh, computerization and change in the telecommunications and media and other industries. Uh, we have now achieved what many cases, outside tariffs and everything else, is the lowest cost of energy. However, what's still uh, done by hydrocarbons the best is store energy the cheapest. That's changing rapidly. So what's happening here is there is a confluence of technologies that are hitting us right now. And now is a very interesting time because electric vehicles, just in the last few months, and I'm giving a lot of speeches and going to a lot of conferences with a lot of oil and gas investors just over the next couple of weeks, electric vehicles have gone from something that I don't think it's going to happen, that's ridiculous, to, oh my gosh, this is happening. Just the number of models that are coming out in the next five to seven years is absolutely breathtaking. Uh, the Chinese announcement, uh, and they, I don't think they've given a specific date yet, that they're going to outlaw the sale of internal combustion cars and trucks. 
also sparked a lot of interest as well as that's been you know, done in, uh, in Great Britain and in France and other places. But what's happening here is the electric vehicle is driving down the cost of batteries. When you go and you visit battery companies, I was over in China five weeks ago, uh, but they're all over the world. All of them are focused on EVs, but what, they don't, uh, what they're starting to understand is as they're driving the cost of batteries down, those batteries, those same batteries, go into the grid, go into homes, go into businesses and so forth, and can provide the balance and the cheaper storage of energy that solar desperately needs. Uh, the other side of that is what could be starting to push electric vehicles uh, a lot faster. And I just came, uh, actually flew in from Washington and, and heard a senator yesterday say that his car had a little bit of autonomous driving to it. And he was, met, he was just amazed that we're already seeing the technologies that, that it, are coming about with uh, auto, autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is best used by electric vehicles. So all these things, and there's some software mixed in here and so forth that we can get and talk about telecommunications, so cellular meters, every one of our customers from Guam, Saipan, all the way to Puerto Rico and all the way north to Massachusetts use a cell-based meter just like a lot of the utilities do. All that technology is coming together and it's pushing on each, each other to really drive down the cost curve far faster than what most people, or frankly anybody, actually has ever predicted. So when I look out and what we're seeing and what we're doing with our customer base, and so again, this is the present. Is it a large portion of the present? You just saw some graphs, absolutely not. But what's happening is a very rapid adoption. And if you look on the left, that's a historical, as was mentioned earlier. This is it, the grid was it. It is the power source. What we're moving to, and frankly right now, this is my house in West U. Uh, and this is where, you know, if you look out at what I think Puerto Rico is going to build their, rebuild their grid to look like and what we're seeing going on in Hawaii and a lot of other places, and you're going to start to see it, is something that looks more like on the right, which is a far better service at a far better price. And that's what Sonova was always founded on, was founded upon, and our slogan is a better service at a better price. This is now where the grid becomes a source an important source, but a source, where you have control communications technologies, solar, genset, maybe a fuel cell. It's amazing the, the Japanese actually have over, at the end of the year, over 200,000 working fuel cells in Japanese homes. That blew me away, but that's really starting to happen. You're starting to see a lot of fuel cell interest just over the last few months uh, in terms of commercialization in China and so forth. Uh, that's still TBD in my mind, but it is out there. Uh, and those gensets usually are, are fired upon natural gas and propane. So don't worry, those of you in oil and gas, we still need a lot of gas, at least that's my opinion, okay? And then batteries are there as well to go in and store the solar when you need it uh, most, uh, just, just as was said a few minutes ago. And so if you look at this, all this means is that we're going to be able to serve the customer at a better level, at a higher reliability, which all of us going through the last storm and, and certainly everybody else in Puerto Rico and, and Florida and so forth, we certainly appreciate the need for a better service than what a strand of wire can provide. Does it make that strand of wire bad? That's not what I'm saying. It's just saying that this can provide a much higher level of reliability than with just one input. I think that's just physics. A little touchy. Um, so the last piece is, uh, you know, what is or what are the challenges? And I will tell you that the biggest challenge is this, that the electric utility industry is not an open industry. Uh, it's not a, as a competitive industry uh, as oil and gas is. And that's a problem. Uh, there was some, you know, the historical, uh, you know, uh, source of that was well uh, mentioned and brought up by Victor, but what we're trying to do, and, and we're trying to move towards that, as Joel said, is a more competitive market here in Texas, but a lot of other areas, it's still vertically integrated, where the utility owns not only the generation, but the poles and wires and the customer as well. So for the first time, solar, since the time of Edison and Westinghouse, is not only 
a distributed fuel, the sun, but it's also a distributed conversion technology from BTU to kilowatt hour or megawatt hour. That's a game changer. It's a big difference. It is ripping apart the current system in a good way. And we need to figure out how to integrate these resources together. That doesn't mean the grid goes away. What it means is the grid's gonna have to do less and less because these distributed resources, namely solar. So a lot of folks, and in fact, I was in one meeting said, when you talk about distributed resources, why don't you just call it what it is, John, it's solar. You're right, it is, it's solar. And so solar is driving a lot of different changes out there and the regulatory bodies, whether it's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or the respective PUCs, public utility commissions, or different politicians are grappling, and of course the utilities, of what to do about this. The first thing and what we stand for in Sonova the whole time is open markets, consumer choice. That means markets that need to be free of subsidies, consumers can choose the winners and losers, government's not going to choose the winners and losers, and that's what we do best in Texas. We are good at competitive markets and capitalism, and we're good at winning. And that's what is, needs to happen here and sweep across the country, and it's starting to do so. So Nevada started to open up, and that was the first major move in 17 years. There was a little election with uh, President Trump that got a uh, little bit more notoriety when that, uh, that vote was happening back in November, but that was a big deal in the electric industry. And we're starting to see those changes uh, because of solar. So I hope that we can move forward and find ways that we can open up markets. But if I had to list one big challenge, that is it. What are the regulators going to do in the respective states and for the country? So I hope, and I'm happy to answer questions at the right time, but uh, I hope you get a little better feel of what's going on. It's an exciting time in the uh, energy industry and the transportation industries. There's a lot of different things to do. And what I will tell you this is, is that things are going faster than most people think. So that's a good thing, and change is always going to bring opportunities with it. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to go with a couple of slides as the economist. I'll, I'll, I'll set up some numbers, and we're going to talk about markets. And, and I agree with Joel and, and Jack that we have a challenge with the market structure here in Texas, and this extends across the, the entire United States. You know, the chairman of California ISO several years ago referred to Texas as a socialist state. We had a piece in the Chronicle back in 2013 pointing out that Texas suffers from a Soviet-style regulated market system. As soon as the Chronicle hit my driveway, the power went out at my house <laughs> for 13 hours along with 5,000 other meters. Joel. It wasn't me. <laughs> your colleague Warren says that it was a planned outage, but I'm still trying to figure out how the branch got from the south side of the street to the north side during a 40 mile an hour norther. <laughs> so let's take a quick look and we see here, this is from uh, the State of the Market Report, the most recent one that's been published uh, by the ERCOT Market Monitor. And we'll see that the price has dropped um, uh, in, in line with, of course, the, the decline in the cost of natural gas to generators. Natural gas provides the marginal uh, kilowatt hour here in Texas. and. So this part of your bill has gone down tremendously. Uh, you can now buy electricity retail for between seven cents a kilowatt hour and, and maybe I guess as much as 11 cents, um, of which on average about three cents goes to the generator. Um, and here's some average numbers as you can see, you know, going back over time from ERCOT North South. And in 2016, you know, you know the wholesale cost to you of, of electricity was less than 2.5 cents a kilowatt hour. This is really quite something. And in the aggregated offer stack, we find that a lot of this is because we're getting power brought into the grid at zero cost. 
or less than average cost because you know the, the wind guys we know that the wind blows out in west texas all the time but mainly at night and that's not when we need it here and so making use of the production tax credit as uh, uh, you know, you know, we were discussing subsidies and uh, it's a a challenge to uh, uh, for any generator to deal with a federal subsidy coming in from a competitor. And so this has been a, a devastating challenge for the traditional old line utilities and, and we haven't even begun to address the issue of, of you know, distributed solar. Um, in the ERCOT market though, there is a potential for some shenanigans and we've seen that over time. And so over, over time, we would get to uh, as we have in August and a couple of times, there's a pivotal supplier or somebody who actually has market control and can bid the price up, make use of the fact that ERCOT is running tight on reliability either due to uh, uh, capacity constraints caused by weather or capacity constraints caused by units taken offline. And so, for example, in 2013, GDF Suez was identified as having taken advantage of the ERCOT market and perhaps accumulating an additional $300 million from the state of Texas that um, might not have uh, otherwise occurred. So it's not a competitive market per se. And, and so how can you say that, hers? Well, the, the answer is it's a monopsony. There's one buyer. And all of you have had microeconomics, and so you know monopoly is, is, is one seller. There's one seller of Windows. There's one seller of the iPhone. But in a monopsony, there's one buyer. And the economic literature on the disruptions that can be caused by monopsony are, are well recorded. Think back to um, Joan Robinson in the, in the Depression era. Think back to the company town where there's only one employer, the mill or, or the factory. Well, here, there's only one buyer of electricity, and it's ERCOT. They set the price, they go for the lowest price. And ERCOT is, for the most part, an electricity only market. So what does that mean? Well, if the Astros were electricity only, only the nine players on the field tonight would be getting paid. The rest of the 25-man roster would not be getting paid. In fact, they'd be bidding with A.J. Hinch, the manager, to go in, and so, and so somebody would be trying to underbid Altuve or Springer, and the rest of the folks on the team would not be getting paid because they weren't in the game. That's an electricity-only market. And so when we talk about generators and having extra capacity, in Texas, those generators are not compensated to stay on the sidelines. They have to come in at a later time, uh, bid in, um, and, and make a living to you know, whatever extent they can. And so we've seen challenges with Calpine, uh, NRG, uh, we've had the, the bankruptcy of uh, Energy Futures Holdings. Um, this has been the reorganization or the, 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 the turnover and disruption that is going on in the Texas market. And it's not necessarily because of the introduction of wind and the introduction of solar, it's because of the structure that ERCOT has to deal with. ERCOT administers the structure um, under, under uh, direction from the Public Utility Commission, which is under direction from the legislature. So what does this, this mean? Um, comparison of all in prices across the markets, ERCOT is significantly lower than most uh, the reason being we have uh, the, the, the tremendous input of wind from West Texas and, of course, now along the um, shore facilities, but also natural gas has become remarkably inexpensive due to the success of fracking. Uh, the other markets are, are generally much higher. California, for example, imports 35% of its electricity on a daily basis. The folks in Wyoming are happy to send their wind power straight to California. Uh, New England ISO, uh, New York ISO, they're having some really tremendous challenges there. In New York, they've just uh, brought in half a billion dollar subsidies to keep two 
uh, of the uh, upstate nuclear plants open. Uh, New England ISO has been shutting down the coal-fired plants, and uh, they're obviously going to be some tremendous disruptions if the millstone facilities go down. That supplies over half the power to the state of Connecticut on a daily basis. So what does this all mean? Now, this slide takes data from the Energy Information Agency, and, and so if we take a look at it, we can um, get, get the idea uh, or the notion that the all-in total cost are, are significantly more than the average price received over the course of a year in ERCOT and generally across the United States. And so it doesn't pay a generator to build new capacity today. It's very difficult to recover capital. The cost of, of bringing power to market as a generator has, has dropped, but it hasn't dropped that much in terms of the capital perspective. Wind turbines are now down to about $25 per megawatt hour uh, or, or 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour, but those have to be built in a huge amount of scale. And as we've discussed, we have problems with intermittency. And especially in Texas, we know nothing is hotter than when the wind doesn't blow on a summer day in Texas. Um, the game of electricity is interesting. Joel referred to the nodes of the ERCOT market. We've got more than 4,800 nodes, and we can trade back and forth across those nodes on a real-time basis and actually on a, a temporal basis. So you're winding up with a combinatorial situation, adding to millions and millions of possible trades and possible transactions at any one moment across the ERCOT grid. But as he talks about distributed electricity and resources, the DER is putting a megawatt plant here, a megawatt plant there, and, and getting it priced to the LMP or the node price. The challenge we see with that is once you put the generator in place, you've relieved the shortage. And so you wind up getting the same price as everybody else does. So you're still not compensated for having put that unit out there. The ERCOT model doesn't allow you to achieve any economic rent. It's just a public good to the ERCOT market. The ERCOT market, in, in, in sum, is a very regulated market. Entry is regulated. Exit is regulated. Um, the fact that 50 to 70 percent of your electricity bill is regulated tells you that if that part of the market is tied down, then certainly the generator part is. And so I would argue that we're not really in a very competitive market in Texas. Um, I want to make a comment about resiliency because the resiliency of the grid has been demonstrated here in Houston. I was here with Alicia and Ike, and three weeks without power is distinctly unpleasant in Texas. One of my colleagues said the reason I got through the Harvey escapade, even with a tornado ripping her roof off, was I had cable TV and air conditioning, and my children made it. And so I noticed on Friday before Harvey came in, Centerpoint had stationed eight bucket trucks around our neighborhood, and they had obviously listened to the, the, the criticisms from Post Ike. And so I think at any one point, the largest number that we had offline in the Houston region was about 150,000, and a total of more than 500, maybe 600,000 over the entire course of the storm. But because of the installation of smart meters, because of the installation of, of better maintenance procedures to keep lines clear, Centerpoint was able to respond. And so if anyone's here from Centerpoint, thank you so much. It maintained the social order in town. And that's part of the regulated environment. Uh, Centerpoint gets its charge for, for bringing you the electricity, no matter what the source. And what we're going to is a, a situation where the wire owner is going to be sending you less power as you put more solar systems on or as you put backup generators on. Even at Minute Maid Park tonight, there's a ribbon going around saying, call Centerpoint for reliable natural gas, and we will install a backup generator at your home. 
If you're on late night TV, you get ads for the Texas Hammer, you get ads for uh, reverse mortgages, you get ads for uh, 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 life insurance, you get other ads, and then you get ads for backup generators. And this tells you how important reliability is going to become as the traditional model falls away. Warren Lasher of ERCOT made a public statement two and a half years ago. He said Texans will learn the cost of reliability. And as John points out, this is going to come from our own installation of backup generators, our own installation of solar panels. We're going to go off the grid, but we're going to assume more of the cost ourselves. And we're going to make, in that sense, our own microgrids, because we're, we've learned that we just can't rely upon the system as it's currently configured. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm not Heather Payne. Uh, she is trying to get here, but I wanted to touch uh, base on a couple of things that she was going to speak about and hope that she will be here for the question and answer session. It turns out that a couple of things she's going to talk about, we're going to talk about, uh, relate to some of the questions that have come up and explain further a little bit of the things that we've already been discussing. Um, so she has studied New York's model a great deal. Uh, New York and California have spent a great deal of time, particularly New York, in planning for the grid of the future. What is that going to look like? What issues does it bring up? Um, and I'll go quickly through this. I want to focus on one of the most important issues that comes up in New York's grid development of the future, and that is resiliency. Um, this, is, this was uh, really brought to the fore by what happened during Superstorm Sandy, the fact that um, certain microgrids, in this case NYU, continued to operate when uh, all of lower Manhattan uh, went, went dark with power. Um, they have increased the amount of smart grid and smart meter installations. Ed referred to the importance of the smart grid for being able to do this kind of balancing. Um, can't get this to move. Incred uh, increased transmission upgrades. Um, and then they've also encouraged critical system relocation within buildings. Um, we've seen the same thing occur here after natural disasters and resiliency at the medical center. After Allison, uh, there was a push to move um, many of the backup generators, many other things out of harm's way. Um, and New York has been doing this uh, on a very consistent basis statewide uh, to try to move critical infrastructure out of harm's way. Similar critical infrastructure resiliency planning, increased building efficiency, and something that we have mentioned in passing, they created a goal for power storage, um, either battery storage or other mechanical energy electricity storage. Uh, California has already also created a mandate for that, which has been pushing uh, some of the uh, storage policies moving forward. Um, New York's primary innovation is this focus on microgrids and the backup power for critical facilities. So let's talk a little bit more about microgrids there. Um, they became a major part of the resiliency story after Superstorm Sandy. New York right now is focusing on what they call community grids. These serve between 100 and 1,000 individual consumers. Um, they are linked directly to each other and certain solar panel power, and then they have one interconnection with the grid instead of having 1,000 different interconnections to the grid. That allows them to isolate off the grid with their own power production using primarily solar, sometimes backup gas generation, um, and sometimes battery storage as well. Um, New York has also taken into account the issue of climate change in a, in a large way. In particular, they're looking at the impact of unforeseen disasters. I don't know how many times we have heard the word unprecedented uh, in the last four weeks in terms of weather events that have never occurred before. Um, but New York is trying to take these into account in planning. Um, and trying to think of different ways to anticipate 
what the unprecedented will look like, which, which sounds like an impossible task, but at least they're, they're trying to do that. And they've given in, increased state funding. Um, they have come across the same issues that we come across in Texas and other locations throughout the country, which is fuel choice, which fuels are more valuable, uh, which sources for power should we be using? Should the government have policies that favor one source over another? And you, you do that because you want to know how much they're valued. So one of New York's critical innovations and something that has circled around all of the conversations that we've talked about in dispatching lowest cost energy is what is lowest cost energy? Is it lowest marginal cost? Because in those cases, you know, wind and solar will beat out when they're, when they're coming on, and once they're built and online. They have higher capital costs. Uh, natural gas sets the price uh, for other marginal cost. But if, in fact, um, grid stability is important, that may make certain kinds of power sources and microgrids more valuable. Um, if uh, it's important to have reliability with baseload power, because you're worried that you don't have enough capacity or other things, as Ed mentioned, then that value needs to be accounted for. Um, the NARUC, which is the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, has been undertaking this examination. And what they're asking states to do in imagining the grid of the future and valuing power sources is to make value choices first. What is important to your state? Is it important to work on controlling uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Is it important to lower the cost of power? Is it important to have reliability? Are all of these things important? How much capacity do, does one need? What about future costs? What about stability? Um, once you decide on those values, then it's up to the state legislature, or more likely the PUC in many states, to try to assign values to those in deciding how prices, uh, how um, these fuel sources should be priced. Why does it matter? It matters, again, in particular for states that are part of these regional transmission organizations, such as New York, California. Most of our country is now part of a regional transmission organization. Because those organizations dispatch power based on the lowest cost and lowest bid cost. Now, if you think having non-greenhouse gas power production is important, then you may add that as a adder or value to say solar power or nuclear power. That means that nuclear power or solar power in a certain case or wind power could undercut the cost of another conventional power source because they are now saying that it is saving money on one of these other values. And that's a really important question, is how do we address this value? The grid of the future will be based, I think, in many ways on what uh, we as society decide is going to be important, what we are looking for. And we do see some differences, I think, b between the states. So with that, I am going to move on to the questions. We've got some really interesting questions for all of our panelists, um, and I want to get to some of those. Got this computer cue going here. Um, but it turns out many of you, being very smart folks, have a lot of similar questions. Um, so I'm going to try to group those together, uh, if that's possible. Um, the first question that capture several questions, is uh, many people ask, why is Texas lagging in solar energy, for instance? Um, and I just want to start by saying one thing we haven't talked about is there are different kinds of solar. There are utility scale installations, and then there are the smaller distributed installations. Uh, from a legal perspective, the larger ones tend to be ruled by PURPA, the law I discussed before, and state policy really has a huge impact on what kinds of contracts are allowed, how they come in. Texas doesn't really have that because of ERCOT. Um, and then with small ones, those in certain cases have been driven by net metering, which we haven't talked about, which is a, um, a policy that does support more uh, solar and distributed generation, um, but is sort of a construct. Um, so I'll turn to you first. Uh, what, what answer do you have about why there's not more solar in Texas? Well, I, I think that uh, you know 
the state, first of all, is divided up really into two camps. If you've got you know, you know, San Antonio and you've got Austin and then you've got Houston and Dallas. And they, if you look at the installations for behind the meter and the utility scale, I do believe, there is a tale of two cities. Um, and so uh, there's a reason for it though. So Austin and San Antonio have heavily subsidized uh, uh, behind the meter solar. They've uh, gone out and they bought PPAs that were higher priced than what they could have procured in the gas market and so forth, gas bar gin. And on, on top of that, they did have net metering, as you said. Now, what's interesting is we're starting to see a shift because I think that they didn't quite anticipate the success right. of solar. <laughs> and, and that cost is dropping. So they've actually become more difficult to work with uh, from my perspective. Uh, so they, Austin's passed this uh, thing called value of solar, which basically means I need to sell the utility on my power that I created on my, my house. And then they get to tell me what I get to buy it back for. Uh, and we can't do lease con uh, contracts and PPAs and so forth because they have monopoly right to sell power. So that makes things a little difficult. Uh, whereas on the other side of things, Houston and Dallas, there's been no support for solar whatsoever, zero. No subsidies ever, no net metering. There was never any, even, even good talk about having solar. Now that's fine, that's what they chose to do. Uh, and so what that has led to is almost no solar installations. There were some subsidies with the LBO, with the EFH, uh, that's the old TXU. But other than that, it, you know, you don't have a lot of installations until this year. So for the first time in the company's history, we started to sell solar in Houston and Dallas and signing up customers in the last few months. Why? Because the price of solar dropped so much that it actually made financial sense. It was starting to make there. Uh, now, the other piece of this is, as batteries are coming down rapidly in price, remember I told you I had batteries in my house, that's going to be a big deal for Houston and Dallas and make Texas viable, is to have that cost of batteries go down, go down in price. So it's a, it's, it's, a compl it's a little bit of a complex answer, but I will also, and I'll end on this, uh, that I've always said, if you look at the major metropolitan areas in the United States, Houston is our most difficult market. And I always get ribbed because that's our headquarters, right? It's Houston. <laughs> yeah, but, but we want to go in the worst possible area and we're going to win. Uh, and, and I've always said that once you start seeing solar on Houston homes, which again, we just started to see a few months ago, it is game over everywhere else because this is the most competitive, hardest place to get and, and make business, uh, make money in my business. And now we're starting to see it. So there's a lot of penetration that's going on uh, in elsewhere in California, the Northeast, all the islands, even Arizona and, and so forth, that's already happened. And so they have a far higher penetration rate than we're seeing. So uh, it's coming, it's coming. Thank you. I just want to highlight one of the things you said. Uh, state policies really can be important. Uh, and of course, Texas is, is so different again because of ERCOT. But uh, whether net metering is supported or not supported, and the other is what is the other what is the average cost of power in that location? That makes a big difference. What their other power sources primarily are. Um, so, thank you for that. It's interesting to see where, where that's going to come. That actually leads into one of the other questions, um, which is what is the role of battery storage, particularly? Um, this question relates to whether or not battery storage or other storage can um, supplement, if you will, the intermittency with uh, wind or solar, uh, particularly on small solar and distributed energy resources. Um, and, and it can also be used at the utility scale as well, um, certainly. But um, it, it sort of, in some ways, becomes a, could become, I suppose, a game changer because it can take, could take away the reliability issue. Uh, I will note that some power producers in New York and in Washington State have been trying to create a uh, peak, I mean, sorry, a base power product uh, guaranteed by supplementing solar or wind with hydro or gas uh, so that the, it, it stays even, like all the way through, and it's kind of a, an alternative, if you will, to battery storage. So I want to put the future of battery storage to you, Ed. It's getting better. There's no question about it. The, the, in fact, there's some research here at the uh, University of Houston where uh, it's been announced that we've, we've brought magnesium into batteries to, to improve the cycling on them. Um, the lithium-ion batteries are, are 
at the current moment, the state of the art, certainly better than the lead acid. Uh, lithium has its own issues and, and tremendously dirty environmental situation in mining of lithium in uh, Mexico, which nobody really pays too much attention to today. And so the search for new technologies is, is very important. It's not just the, the, the battery itself um, and, and driving the cost down through the manufacturing, uh, but you know, how it could be supplanted, for example, by uh, photosynthesis. Uh, some, some work by Daniel Nasera at, at Harvard or by Gary Brudvig at uh, Yale. Um, and so there are some, some technologies that are adjuncts to the solar, adjuncts to wind, and adjuncts to batteries that are coming along. Battery is extremely important for solar because, you know, just with a cloud passing across the solar panel, the, the utilization panel can drop dramatically from, from whatever its 100% capacity is to, to basically zero. In, in the matter of a second and a half. And so running it through a battery will stabilize the flow to the, the home or the business. Um, the location is extremely important as well. And so for you know, a warehouse that does 13, 14 megawatts of, of power consumption at any one point, the rooftop is probably good for about one or two megawatts. And so there's going to need to be additional um, uh, cells placed around the facility in order to keep that plant at full operation. So there are a lot of engineering issues, all of which are solvable. These, these can be reached. The issue is just how much is the consumer willing to pay for it. And um, you know, we're getting there. The, the drive, uh, uh, as, as John points out, is, is progressing the way the, the costs were lowered for in semiconductors, the way costs were lowered for flat panel screens. And um, it certainly is, is much closer on the technological horizon now than it was 10 years ago or, or than it was uh, 35 years ago when I was in the Office of Conservation and Solar Energy at the Department of Energy. Well, and when you talk about battery storage, one can also think about other alternative ways of, of balancing power. Um, Increased uh, transmission lines, that's what Germany has used in many ways. Texas saw some good from that, from the build out uh, from wind power um, in West Texas into East Texas. And you referred in your talk to solar coming online in West Texas and being needed, or I guess you did, when, in, in, when Houston uh, needs it um, in the early evening, which is when power is at its greatest thing. And a study out of the University of Texas actually estimated that it is more efficient to optimize grid decision making, like power balancing, than it is to use batteries, that you actually get more efficiency by just having better microsecond decisions about where power is coming from and, and peaking. Um, you mentioned, Joel, that um, you, you were surprised in some way, if I'm understanding you, about the wind penetration in Texas and you're looking at solar. How far do you think it can go? Well, um, I think I'd say what I said earlier that if you asked me 10 years ago if we thought we could ever have 50% wind penetration, I'd say, oh, I don't think so. Uh, but now we've done it, and we're not afraid anymore because, you know, it's, it's, even though it's come fast, it's come slow enough that we've been able to learn from it and react to it. So, you know, I'd still have to say, unfortunately, I don't know how much wind penetration that we can handle, but, um, I'm actually not worried about it that much anymore because I don't think, I don't think we're going to see 100% wind penetration. I think what we're going to see is solar coming now. I think it's solar's time. And solar uh, is, is uh, something I'm less afraid of because solar is very correlated with the actual load. It, you know, the solar comes on as the air conditioners at your house come on and pretty much stays there. Now, like, like I mentioned earlier in California, they have a problem because what happens is that the load comes up in the morning with the solar, and then during the kind of the uh, middle hours of the day, the load drops off and the solar is still going strong, and they can't back off some of their con conventional power plants fast enough. That's that duck curve we talked about. And then in the evening, it shoots up really fast because people are heading home and they're cooking and, and they're turning on their appliances and stuff, and the solar is starting to back off then. Now, we're gonna have a little bit less of a problem because if, if we build a lot of our power plant, or a lot of our solar out west, but you know, I, I don't think we'll have a problem handling because we have a large fleet of you know, fast responding generation too 
provided they are still there, um, to your point. Um, I don't to answer yeah, your question. That's absolutely great. Um, uh, one more question to you, Joel, which is about the non-renewable uh, sources on ERCOT. Um, we had several questions noting uh, the increased prevalence of drought. We referred to the climate change. We referred to unpredictability of weather. Um, even using thermal power plants, Texas has had some issues um, with the water, either not being enough water or the water being too hot. Um, how is ERCOT planning to address that in the future? Well, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you know, ERCOT doesn't decide what power plants are going to get built. Right. It's the market that determines that. So we don't have any control over that, to be honest with you. Right. Um, uh, we have to, what, uh, theoretically what would happen in this market is uh, if someone, um, a power producer is trying to make money and, and right when the prices are really high, they have to shut down because they don't have water, they might look at, well, maybe we need to have some additional water here or maybe the next plant that gets built will be, and that's what's happened, I think, sometimes is these new plants that are getting built are, are not needing as much water. Mm -hmm. Or they might use some other technology. Uh, but, you know, ERCOT is, is, is more the air traffic controller of the system. We're not, we're not controlling the plane. We're, we're just monitoring the planes that are in the air and making sure they don't hit each other. Mm -hmm. We're not deciding which planes are going in the air. So let's talk about the, the market then in ERCOT. I'm, I'm turning back to you, Ed, just for a moment here. Um, the, the point you bring up is, is, is a very valid one, that power producers, the, the risk of not building the right kind of power production falls on them, on the private sector, whereas in many regulated states, you could say it sort of falls on the public because they get guaranteed rates built in when they build a new plant or something. Um, you see that as a potential real problem in Texas? Or? It, it, it is a problem in Texas. In fact, I think ERCOT is defending a lawsuit right now brought by one of the power producers, Panda Power, who used the ERCOT forecast study to say, geez, they're going to need new capacity soon. They raised $2 billion, built $2 billion worth of power plants. And just by building the plants and bringing it to market, they eliminated any issue of any capacity constraints, number one. Number two, ERCOT also revised the capacity constraints down and they, they got very unhappy with that. And, and so they've, they've got this pending litigation, which is, in my opinion, total nonsense. It, it, they built the extra facilities without understanding the dynamics of the market. Uh, it's very difficult to build new power plants. We had a, a big discussion um, two years ago, and we have the Houston import project underway, bringing power from North Texas down to, to Houston. Calpine and uh, NRG bid to build 600 odd megawatts in Houston. Instead, the Public Utility Commission decided to go with the uh, more expensive uh, power line transfer. The power line, of course, those builders will be compensated. NRG and Calpine were not going to be compensated or not have a guaranteed compensation. So the market dynamics are different. Um, you know, the three members of the Public Utility Commission in Texas are all lawyers who work for right-of-way companies. And so I guess, you know, whenever they see uh, a problem, they have only one tool and that would be the hammer and everything looks like a nail. Um, but this is very, uh, uh, the right term uh, uh, would be disheartening for uh, the traditional generators in the state because the, the game is not set that uh, it's going to end well for them. Um, we could have future bankruptcies of generators. I expect them. And as, as those go offline, uh, Joel's job is going to become much more difficult. And, uh, you know, losing... Uh, five gigawatts of capacity of coal plants in um, uh, East Texas or, or some of the, the gas plants who are actually swapping out and, and deciding they can sell to Mexico instead, such as Frontera did uh, last year. Um, they can't really leave the town, but they can come as close to it as they can and sell outside of ERCOT. And that, that has created a small problem down in South Texas. Um, so we're going to have some tremendous dynamic changes here. Uh, and solar is going to be a solution for reliability, uh, as will 
you know, calling up Centerpoint and putting a gas generator in your garage. Um, recently, uh, in looking at innovating products, if you will, and different energy sources and what the grid is in the future, uh, thinking outside of the box in, in some uh, places in Europe that are adopting higher and higher renewable sources, um, there have now become, been companies that are offering, instead of offering power per se or electricity per se, they're offering what you use the power for. So in instance, you get to buy um, not comfort, but a comfortable temperature in your home. And they may deliver that product with electricity or energy efficiency uh, or I don't know what, what other ways, but they believe that that may be the future. In other words, moving completely away from electricity as everything. Um, and I, maybe we see some of that with the, the new home you were talking about, although it still looked at electricity sources. What, what do you see as the role of energy efficiency, as an example, in that construct of the, of the now current and or future home? Well, I, I think that goes to a lot of home automation, mm -hmm. which means a, a lot of different things to a lot of folks. And it's really a different uh, business uh, than, than our business. Right. We're, we're, we're a power company. We're supplying power. Um, and there are some people that try to mix those two together. Mm -hmm. And um, the success really hasn't been there because they're two very different businesses, right. whether that's the way they're sold, the way they're uh, installed, and the way that uh, they're maintained. But it's also energy efficiency is a, is a much harder business because it's very difficult to tell people, well, you know, just think what it would have been if you hadn't spent that money, right? right? To prove the, the negative, and it's really, it's impossible. And so you've seen a lot of home builders over the last, uh, you know, couple of decades or so, every one of them that's tried to guarantee savings so much to some of that way has gotten sued and lost. Yep. So they don't do it anymore. Um, it's the, whole, it's the other thing about trying to get an idea that people are gonna change their behavior based on price. It, it really hasn't worn out, quite frankly. So I think that's going to be much more of kind of what your Google, Amazon, and those folks are going to come in with some home automation, kind of make that real interesting and, and nice for Great. folks. And speaking of resiliency, thank you, Professor Payne, for joining us. Uh, getting here. She, she can take my spot. <laughs> uh, that's right. You have to go soon, so. Yes, after, uh, thank you. after leaving the house at 9 o'clock this morning, I've had a quite a lesson in resiliency myself today. Yes, you have. You have had quite an example of resiliency. Actually, you're here uh, in time for me to direct uh, another question uh, to you. Um, and, and, and that is one of the questions that has come up is, what, what role do you see of uh, carbon price playing in this valuation of different kinds of electricity? I mean, we've already seen New York do this zero emission what is it, Z? Z ZEC, zero emission credits. Okay. Um, so New York is actually doing a couple different things with that. So obviously New York and Illinois have um, both gone forward with zero emission credits, both of which have been upheld by, upheld by federal district courts at this point in time. Um, for New York, they've also looked at doing different values for distributed energy resources and have developed a very specific value stack um, on how they're going to We did show that those. slide, but yes. Okay, great. Um, and then the, the other thing is that um, they are actually looking at putting a price of carbon into their um, competitive market. So the New York PSC along with the New York ISO just released a white paper um, that was done by the Brattle Group looking at um, how the competitive market could actually factor carbon in and what that would look like. So while that's still very much in process, um, it is something that they're actively looking at. Um, just to follow up with that, uh, do you think there's going to be any pushback from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as they try to bring that into the um, uh, regional markets? I think that there's certainly more of a potential for that with the new FERC commissioners than there would have been even six months ago. Of course, New York is in an interesting position because they are a single state ISO, and the ISO has actually indicated that they are very interested in finding ways that the competitive markets 
can take state policy into account. So because of that, there's a likelihood that they'll go forward, whether that's challenged and what ends up happening with that challenge is obviously still to be determined. So moving to ERCOT's market, if there were a federal price on carbon, let's say not from the state, but from new policy changes, a tax or something of that nature, how do you see that altering uh, the, ba uh, the, dis the, the power uh, mix in, in ERCOT? Well, what would happen is the uh, market, the generators would factor in the carbon credits that they were going to get into their offer price. Mm -hmm. And again, we're going to just get the cheapest megawatt wherever that's at in the state, provided there's no congestion, and that's where we're going to dispatch it. So, yes, it would, it would change the dispatch order somewhat, but it would also make the wind more, even more competitive, right? Right. Exactly. Um, you, you talked about just their balancing... Um, uh, balancing the, the voltage in the grid. Um, ha, is there a possibility of, and I, I, maybe this just again goes back to the private sector in Texas, but the possibility of being able to value um, or, or ascertain how valuable that power is based on where it comes into the grid? And does ERCOT have a role in that? The, the I mean, there's a, there's you know, unlimited ways we could right. do, solve all these problems, right, depending on if the, there's a political will and such. Um, but Texas is a pretty tight grid, and there's, there's really not that much transportation cost to move it a long right. ways. Right. Now, I would argue, though, that as a grid operator, I do like the idea of having, the, the closer you get the power generation to the power consumption, that's just, that's just like if you were, if you were having this conference in, at home, <laughs> you wouldn't have this, this uh, possibility of uh, the interruption of the transportation, right? So I like to, you know, as a grid operator, having more uh, solar in Houston or having more generation in Houston, it reduces the risk of the transmissions part of the equation. So that's always a good thing. If you look at some of the large uh, blackouts that we've had in the United States, what caused it, it was usually transporting large amounts of power from Canada to the Northeast, you know, because they could buy cheap hydro up in the Northeast. You have less risk if you, you know, of a lightning strike taking out a portion of the grid. Um, what, has New York done any work on locational pricing? Yes, they have. So um, within the value stack, the major portion of that for energy is the locational marginal value of pricing. How do they measure that? It's based on the specific node including losses. So they do have a very specific way that they're going to do that. Um, and then also, of course, part of the capacity value is also based on the location of the distributed energy resource. I, I want to go back with some of these questions to reliability again and, and, and back to you, Ed. Um, do we see some, and, and, and uh, John referred to this, some perhaps really innovative ways of using things we already have to, to balance reliability? So for instance, you know, if there are more electric cars, will they be the storage? We've seen Amazon and Microsoft say that you can use their backup systems as peakers or storage or that sort of thing. Do you, do you see that? Is a, is a game changer in any way? I think there are game changers coming. I don't know that we can see which ones are. are going to be the ones that get there. Um, you know, one of the studies done by Heart Energy here, uh, uh, a large consultancy locally, was that the U.S. grid would have to be remade to charge um, uh, at least one car. Let's you know, we're in Texas, so it's what. 1.5 cars per person, but, <laughs> but the rest of the country is, is about you know, one car per person. And so if you have a two-car family, one of those will become electric for certain uh, in the next, say, 10, 15 years. You know, the grid is designed to, to have an ebb and flow of power, and so we're going to have to replace the transformers and, and, and find a way to manage the infrastructure at night. Having batteries at the home certainly uh, could be useful with that. Charging at the office could be helpful. Uh, nobody's quite figured out exactly what this is going to look like. Right. 
and that's important. Um, I, want to, I want to talk about the moment, the locational pricing. Yes. You know, for those of you who are engineers or, or math majors, this is linear programming, linear <laughs> algebra. And, and so the models become really complex. Um, uh, the ability to have some sort of capacity pricing is in there because that gets us away from the electricity only style of, of market. And um, the different markets across the United States are just trying to get that incorporated. Uh, going to what, what, what John had talked about and then and with Joel, uh, right now we're under some incandescent lights. And so yes, the amount of electricity that, that comes from a coal-fired plant uh, gets reduced to only 2% of the output of the lumens here. And, and that's really quite an extraordinary loss of 98% efficiency, efficiency loss of the heat value as it comes out to usable light. And we could go around the university, replace all of these with LEDs, and we could cut the consumption of the university uh, significantly, a third perhaps. Right. And uh, maybe we have all of the baseload generation we will ever need. How quickly can we change the way we consume it? Mm -hmm. and, and what's the cost-benefit analysis? And, and that's something that several groups are working to determine. Do you think in particular energy efficiency in, in Texas is somewhat harder to come by because of the low marginal price of natural gas? I mean, in a, you know, it, 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 why, why would you if you can just pay X amount uh, for the cheap power. Uh, you know, it, it, that's absolutely true. Um, but if we can get more more efficient air conditioning, certainly it's going to to lead to greater disposable income for us. Right. Uh, right. The uh, uh, um, lighting, I think, is something that we've all gone about and, and changed. How many of you have bought LED bulbs in the last year? And and okay, how many of you have bought LED bulbs three years ago? And so a significantly smaller number. So this is, this is a gradual change. Right. Well, um, our, our time is up. And I want to thank all of you so much, uh, especially you, Heather, for traveling. Please join us at the reception. We'd love to continue this conversation. I'm not sure we solved a problem, but I hope we at least illustrated uh, how some of these issues are interrelated uh, and what we're going to have to be facing in the good of the future. Ramanan? Thank you so much. Thank you all the panelists for a wonderful So I want to quickly thank our, our sponsors, uh, our media sponsors, uh, the, uh, the Houston Chronicle as well as uh, the Houston Public Media, our Energy Coalition volunteers. Please stay around for the reception. Uh, it'll op those doors will open up and that will be the queue for us to go in there. And I want to invite you back in mid-November, November the 16th, for a discussion that is a lot more to do with oil and gas. Uh, and, uh, and it comes back to the issue of the production that's coming out of the Permian, uh, the issue of peak demand, and asking the geopolitical question, is that the death of OPEC? Uh, and does um, the Texas Railroad Commission become the, the controller of pricing of oil and gas. And so, so that's, that's the theme for November the 16th. I invite you to come back for that. Uh, and, uh, and we will have a, an exciting discussion then on that topic. Again, thank you all. Thanks, Victor. Thank, thank the panel for that wonderful discussion. Thank you.